talent council is recruiting 24 seven. So what the talent council does at our conference is they go around and they start writing down, I met all these people. And we actually have a pavilion at our conference where the talent council is helping recruit and having those conversations with people about where their journey may take them. So it's flipping the whole process of, well, we say we lead with the volunteer, not the vacancy. Oftentimes organizations lead with a vacancy. We've got a hole here, who's interested? We lead with a volunteer and say, how do you want to contribute? Based on what time you have, because time is precious. Not everyone can sit on a three for three years and passions. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I am speaking with Rick Grimm, CEO of NIGP, the Institute for Public Procurement. Hey, Rick, welcome to the show. Joanna, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this podcast. Hey, Rick, tell us about NIGP. The organization has been around since actually the end of World War II, so a little over 70 years. And interestingly enough, the uh, reason why the organization came to be, and this is kind of happens for many associations, is that as World War II was winding down, our collegial friends at the uh, Conference of Mayors got their procurement directors together and said, we've got a problem about government surplus. Can you, as procurement officers, help us resolve that issue? And they did. They brought the chief procurement officers together. And then the chief procurement officers said, okay, we did that. But we actually enjoy having conversations with each other. Ah. Hey, let's create an association. So actually, we consider LaGuardia, who was, of course, mayor of the city of New York, but was also the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He's actually kind of the founding bright spot for NIGP. So now I have another reason to think of LaGuardia when I fly into the airport. Right. So, Rick, your name is NIGP, but you call yourselves the Institute for Public Procurement, That doesn't match your acronym. So at some point you rebranded. Why did that happen and when did that happen? Rebranding occurred actually in about 2010-11. And the reality was that we knew that we didn't want to change NIGP because it's recognized as a brand, particularly in the public sector and most dominantly in the public procurement side. So what did it stand for before? It stands for National Institute of Governmental Purchasing. And these are maybe subtle differences, but they're not semantical differences. We're not national, we're international. We are an institute, so we are a charitable trust. Government is an area when you think about state and local governments or the federal government, but we also expand into public service organizations. Good example is a lot of times you don't think of a school district as a government but it is. You don't think of colleges and universities as governments, but if they're getting funding from the federal or the state authorities, they are a government. So they actually would identify them as a public sector organization or a port authority, whether it's an airport or it's a seaport or an electrical utility. Those are, they're part of what we would identify as public service or public sector. They don't necessarily see themselves as governments. And then purchasing is a slice of the entire procurement cycle, which actually begins with identifying what your needs are. Purchasing is kind of like, how do we 
maximize competition by the methods that we use, whether it's doing a bid or it's an RFP. I think contract administration is a part of that. Disposal of equipment and supplies is also part of the procurement cycle. So when we think about trying to expand the view of kind of the strategies and programs that we offer at NIGP, we want to be more inclusive than being national. We want to be more expansive beyond government. And we want to think of purchasing as a slice of the larger procurement pie. And that's why, well, you continue to use the acronym NIGP, but we'll say the Institute for Public Procurement. So, Rick, I got a chance to visit your website before this interview, and you have something called Radio NIGP. And there was an episode where the host was talking about prices rising, where I guess what's happening is post-contract, vendors are coming back and saying, hey, we're dying here. We got to have a price increase. And so they're asking for some relief. And what you're telling us is that that's not part of the purchasing, but that's part of procurement because the purchase has been done. And hence the bigger umbrella term, procurement. Exactly right. Yeah. And the idea really was to not jettison government and purchasing, but to expand it. Because if you can expand your market, you're going to grow the profession. And so that was really one of the key components of wanting to rebrand the name. So, Rick, before we get into the things that NIGP is doing to thrive as an organization, tell us about your journey to becoming CEO of NIGP. Yeah, that's an interesting journey. It always is. A lot of our colleagues in professional associations actually had a sense of where they wanted to be in their career. Doctors, attorneys, engineers, architects. You go to colleges and universities and get your doctorate degree to go through that. And people do not go to school to be a public procurement professional. In some respects, they may go through a public administration mm. program or a public service program, but they don't have a degree that they can get in public procurement. Now, this is a contentious piece for us at NIGP because although we have a great deal of respect for attorneys and doctors, we realize that $4.5 trillion, that's with a T, $4.5 trillion dollars run through public procurement, federal, state, and local on an annual basis. And by the way, you would say the majority of that is federal. No, about 50% of it is in state and local. Wow. So our quagmire, our conundrum, is that you have a profession that controls $4.5 trillion, and we don't have a way in which we prepare for a workforce. Essentially, people in public procurement fall into public procurement, including my own journey when I was working in Miami-Dade County in Florida, large government jurisdiction in the Miami, Florida area. And I was the fleet manager, and I was responsible for both our light and heavy equipment fleet, batteries, tires, fuel. I never could get it out of procurement. And so I was younger, and I was a little bit more ornery than I am today. And I said, you know, you need to fix this procurement. It's a mess. Hmm. I can't get my police cars moving. And sure enough, what happens? I'm now the purchasing director and I've got to fix it. And so I gravitated to this organization. When you complain, they say, this is your problem. You fix it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You complain, you now have the problem. So I, I heard about this organization called NIGP. I started doing classes. I would go to the conferences. I just so happened to be in at that point, I was living in the Denver, Colorado area. Denver was the host for our 50th conference for NIGP. I was on the local planning committee. I was discovered and then was put on the board and then applied to be the CEO when that opportunity came. So it's a lot about fate. Rick, it's always interesting to learn how association CEOs land where they do. But let's turn now to NIGP and the things you're doing to thrive. You say that governance is a big part of your success. Tell us why. So the question of governance, when you think about putting people either on the staff side or also on the kind of the volunteer leadership side, do you leave that to fate? Is it about, well, I, you know, I met Alice and Frank at a cocktail hour. I think they'd be great for a position on the board. Or should we be much more intentional about who we put in the seats on the board, in our case, a governing board, because 
the voice that they represent, the lens that they have really strengthens not only governance in its diversification, but also gets to better decision-making, which allows the organizations to thrive. Let's think about this for a second. So in the private sector, often organizations, companies will look for board members because they bring certain experiences and skill sets. They'll say, you know, we need someone who's really good at finance. We need someone who's really helped take a company to scale, et cetera. So you're saying that with associations, often there isn't that kind of intention, right? They'll say, well, who wants to be on the board? And then whoever applies gets nominated and voted on. Or perhaps, I mean, I've seen some associations say, you know, we need people who represent the small members, the medium-sized members, and the larger members. But I don't see the kind of intention that you're talking about. So you did something really interesting with your governance. If you are thinking about how you're going to grow an organization, how you're going to remain relevant, is you have to think of this from a strategy standpoint. And so let your strategic plan identify where your direction is, and then make sure that you're aligning people to the strategic plan. I think coming back to your position about, you know, I need someone who's strong on finance, or I need someone who's strong in understanding events. But what we've realized that I think is true for most associations is that the composition of the board are people from the profession. Yes. And we think that we move people from a profession to the board that they'll be able to change that hat. Well, we don't want them to lose the perspective of being from the profession because they could be member-centric. But if that's the only perspective you have, the only lens you have on governance, you're very homogeneous, and you may miss some opportunities. And you have people who don't know how to run associations, which is what you are. Exactly right. Exactly right. Or, well, I know how to do that because, you know, I am the finance treasurer for my local PTA. Well, that actually doesn't quite do it. One of the things that we looked at, and you know, there's some language in there that among us friends you want to watch. Hmm. We talked about, well, we want a competency-based board. Ah. Well, you can imagine the red flags that came with the existing board. Ah. So are you saying that we're not competent? No. What we're saying is, what are the competencies that we need in order to thrive as an organization? And quite honestly, Joanna, that has to be driven by the strategic plan. So if our strategic plan looked at it, coming back to this initial thing about falling in, and I'll show you how this kind of works, falling into the profession, well, we want a prepared workforce. Again, 4.5 trillion, let's get people who understand the value of public procurement and can get the best value for the tax dollar. So the way in which to kind of address that is to begin to get public procurement understanding in colleges and universities. Well, we don't know actually how to get curriculum into colleges and universities. Maybe we need to bring someone onto the board who understands the navigation for how to get curriculum, public procurement curriculum into colleges and universities. Ah. So if it's part of our strategic plan, but you look around to the board and say, who has expertise in that? No one does. So let's be intentional about bringing people onto the board that are not necessarily from the profession, but they are such a stakeholder that they can be the guiding individual to ask the fundamental questions. Have you thought about, and they just fell on the blank, have you thought about if you're trying to get colleges and universities to put public procurement into their curriculum, how would you do that? One of the fundamental shifts here in this governance is it's a shared governance model. So what we did, and as we had this conversation, we began to look at what are all kind of the statutory requirements of the governing board. And that's going to be built into your bylaws, into your existing policies. And when we started counting it up, we had 67 roles and responsibilities that the board did. Wow. Yeah. And some of those are very, very important, like establishing the budget or establishing the strategic plan. Some of them, not so much on the strategy, but on the operational side. So rather than them putting all of the apple into that one cart, we actually created four separate bodies in a shared governance. So we have a governing board, but we also have a member council that does all of the care and the feeding of the membership. So 
Our chapter affiliates are part of what the member council does. New programs for members, marketing, that's all on the member council. That's the second one. We have a third one that's the finance council. So they're doing budget, they're doing appropriations, they're looking at risk assessment, they're looking at investment strategies, and then monitoring performance for results. And then we have a talent council. Now, the talent council is somewhat interesting because it is the funnel by which we go to the member and say, not to Joanna, we say, Joanna, I want to put you on the nominating committee. What we do is we actually have a conversation with Joanna and say, listen, I know time is very valuable for you. How do you want to contribute to the effectiveness of NIGP? Ooh. Let's not talk about jobs or all. Well, I can't do a three-year, but I would like to do, maybe to do some writing. For the role of the talent council, it's, it is the HR funnel for NIGP. And so they have conversations with Joanna and learn that rather than putting our committee, I've got a, a writing that I need to do on a new uh, position paper. Three months, very, very focused. I have someone who's passionate about writing, wants to do that, doesn't want to be on a committee. We find a way in which to engage Joanna on doing that. Wait, so this is brilliant. So these conversations really allow you to learn more about the member, learn about how they want to be engaged. And then this talent committee or talent board really looks for the right opportunity for me. Now, who do you have these conversations with and how do you do them? Is it everybody? And where do you put this data? We still have an application process, but a lot of times when you think about an application, it's, you know, tell me everything you want to do and you ever done. But you're also applying for something specific. Right. That's exactly right. And I think that there's an old adage that there's one reason why your windshield is much bigger than your rear mirror. You want to be forward thinking. You want to see where you're going. So helping people, and I, I don't think it's unique to NIGP. I think if you're in a involved in a nonprofit, you want to contribute for the betterment of the profession that has given you so much kind of the pay it forward mentality. So we use the application just as the beginning of the conversation. And then we actually have a group within our talent council who spends the time for about 45 minutes talking to the joiners of the world and say, how would you like to contribute? Now, they know in the background all of these opportunities. They know about episodic. They know about short term. They know about the structure of the organization. Wow. And they begin to identify the ways in which Joanna wants to serve, utilizing her talents and passions. Joanna is a happy camper. We are now increasing our volunteer core, and we have an engaged member. So the talent council is responsible for that. So those are the four bodies. When we finalized this, the board shifted from 67 roles and responsibilities to 23 Oh, and pushed out the remaining to the other three councils. So what have you gotten down there? Now you have a very focused governing body that does specific tasks and responsibilities. You have people that have no interest in doing finance, so you wouldn't put them on the finance council. But you have people that are really into, I love assessing risk. I love looking at investments. You put them on the finance council. So now you're starting to align individuals' skills and talents and passions with the job functionality. Instead of asking the board members to like fill all those roles and do things that they don't have experience at. Exactly right. So now when you talk about that competency-based boards, you are putting people on the finance council that understand how finances work. You're putting people who understand volunteer leadership. You're putting them on the talent council because that's where their passion is. They want to meet people. They want to be at a conference and see you. In a, maybe you were doing a presentation. They go, oh my gosh, we've got to get Joanna on X, Y, and Z. And so they have that lens of looking for that right person and keeping the board much more focused on strategy. So Rick, you've got all this amazing talent that's now serving on your board and councils, but how do you get them there? Right. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a talent council that actually does all of the recruitment. By the way, when I say all, I mean all, including the board. Huh. So in a traditional format, there's a nominee committee. 
Guess who's on the nominating committee? It's a repositioning of officers. The immediate past president is usually the chair of the nominating committee. And what lens do they have? They have exactly that narrow lens of how they've done it on the board. So the talent council actually does all of the recruitment for board members, as well as their own talent council, as well as committees, et cetera. And so they are coming in and looking at individuals from a competency base, looking at the skills that you need for the organization. They will take that strategic plan when it comes to the board. They'll take that strategic plan and say, listen, we have a hole between the expertise on the board and strategic initiative number two. Let's find someone that fills that hole, including thought leaders that can fill that hole. Wow. Now, the interesting way in which we structured it is that the board ultimately makes a decision on a competitive slate. So we always send a minimum of two candidates. But we're outside of the framework of, well, you know, yeah, you brought me Joaquin and Josie, but I really, I like Alice better. They can't do that. So the board is no longer making a decision about who was on the board because they're my friend Mm. or I met them at a cocktail party. Because there's no way to do that. There's no way to do that. You can reject what the talent council sends to you in terms of recommendations, but the way in which you reject it is you send the talent council back to do their work again. And here's what's happened, which I think is, it's really heartwarming because you could tee this up from a book standpoint, but the culture of the organization really has to be able to embrace that, is that the respect that the governing board has with the talent council, it's been eight years of practice. They have never sent a group of nominations back to the talent council and told them they got it wrong. They have been disappointed because they wanted Alice on the board and Alice was the wrong fit. Right. So then the question becomes, find the place for Alice that better suits Alice's interests and experiences. Absolutely. And the talent council knows that. Yeah. But you also have a board that is, even though they're in the at appointment, they have to make the final decisions on appointment. That whole recruitment, finding the right people for the right seats is all done by that independent talent council that is sharing that nomination process with the board. And that's always been a responsibility for a board. I talked to my colleagues and CEOs, well, how do you handle the nomination process? Who's on that? And I said, well, it's actually removed from the board. They go, how do you do that? Well, because we've got this group over here and we respect the shared governance model. You know, I'm thinking about the fact that you call it a talent council in the same way that you think about procurement and not just purchasing. If you call it a nominating committee, they nominate the people and then their job is done. But when you're a talent council, your job is to source and nurture the talent, it sounds like, which means it becomes a relationship for the long haul. So maybe Joanna does this three-month writing thing what's next for her? And it might be something next year that's something entirely different. I love this. Yeah. The terms that we use are very, very intentional. Because you're right, it's not nominating. Because one of the things about a nominating process, and associations do this all the time, it's time to recruit. So they put out something on their website, says we're looking for people to come in. And so they fill out an application. They may or may not even have a conversation with someone. And then they get the uh, Dear John letter. Right. Well, I'm sorry, but we picked someone else. That's not going to engage individuals. What you're looking for is people who say, you know what? I just finished my my master's degree. I just love this profession. How can I give back? And so they will have that conversation with the talent council. Talent council is recruiting 24-7. Wow. So what the talent council does at our conference is they go around and they start writing down, I met all these people. Wow. And we actually have a pavilion at our conference where the talent council is helping recruit and having those conversations with people about where their journey may take them. So it's flipping the whole process of, well, we say we lead with the volunteer, not the vacancy. Yes. Oftentimes organizations lead with a vacancy. We've got a hole here who's interested, we lead with a volunteer and say, how do you want to contribute based on what time you have? Because time is precious. Not everyone can sit on a three for three years. And passions. 
I can't tell you how many times they put people on a finance committee and they don't want to do finance. They hate finance, but at least it's some way I can contribute. Right. And so, you, you know, three years down the road, well, we're going to put you for a second term. And no, I don't want to do a second term. I didn't want to do the first term. <laughs> Life's too precious to waste someone's time to put them on a, on a council that they don't want to participate in. So really, it is about making sure that we're recruiting the right talent. And, you know, that kind of goes back to some company principles too, you know, get the right people on the right seats. Absolutely. So, Rick, the reason I even got introduced to you is because I was having lunch with Lindsay Curry and we talked about governance. And I said, you know, it just exactly what you talked about. Usually the boards of these organizations source the board members from the profession. And I said, I wonder if there could ever be a time when association execs could be on each other's boards because they know how to run an association. And she said, oh, you need to talk to Rick Grimm because I'm on his board. So you have association execs on your board. How did that happen and what's been the result? So that was right at the beginning. We actually did this whole transformation all in 2014-15. So we went from one board to the board of three councils on shared governance. At the same time, we said, we realized that the majority of members should be coming from the profession because they have that lens. But how do we begin to align stakeholders from outside of the profession who can give us what I refer to as the aha moment. Ah. So for the NHB board itself, it's a board of 11. Three are thought leaders, what we call thought leaders. Now that's the second little red flag about using language because an individual would say, how come I'm not a thought leader? Because I'm from the profession and you don't think I'm thoughtful? Ah. And actually, I'm not trying to make light of that because it was a big deal back in 2014. But a thought leader is coming from outside of the profession, but their insights, their lens, their expertise is so critical to the direction you're going. Now, let me give you an example. By the way, we have thought leaders on the governing board, but we also have thought leaders on the finance council and also on the talent council. And we'll show you how we utilize them. So we've got a three-pronged strategic plan. One is working on colleges and universities to create a, a stronger relationship. We've got one on adult learning, lifelong learning, and then we have one on building our chapter network. So when we're looking at our thought leaders, we're saying, so if these are our three strategies, who do we need to have on the board to help us with the conversations? And so back in 2015, I'll use some names because they're great individuals and they're dear friends, and hopefully I'll spike some interest and you'll say, oh, well, maybe I, I should talk to this individual. So we had been using Jeff Cobb from Taboras. Mm, no, Jeff. He is probably one of the foremost experts in understanding about adult learning and digital. Okay, so we have a Jeff who we've been working at and doing a little bit of consulting for NIGP. And then we have a business strategy, part of our strategic plan, that says, how do we grow education for lifelong learners, particularly in a digital environment? Well, it makes common sense that one of these thought leaders should be Jeff Cobb. Mm. So you know Jeff. I'm sure a lot of your audience knows Jeff. The most kind of under the radar, but so insightful. Agreed. And Jeff would just say things that just went, really? We didn't think of it that way. And this is really the beauty of the thought leadership, that if you have bought into it as a governing board, and realize that, A, you don't have all the answers, but we could bring people onto that team that have a different perspective, have a different expertise, then you're making better decisions. You know, it's all about the data that you have or the frame of reference that you have in order to make the best decisions for the organizations. So another thought lead on the governing board is the CEO for the American Society for Public Administration. Hmm. This is the organization that has journal editors, deans of schools of public administration, public policy, PhD students. This is the resource that can help us talk about how do we bridge if that's our strategy. So the CEO for ASPA, Bill Shields, is on an NGB's board. And so when we're talking about strategy, Bill will say things that we never even thought of because he has the frame of reference to know, listen, you can spend all your energy 
trying to build student chapters, that's not going to get you to the result you're trying to achieve. Here's how you navigate through colleges and universities. And we go, never even thought about that. Oh, my. Amazing. Yeah. So that's the beauty of the thought leader. The other thing is, if you're ever thinking about that, don't use them as an expertise that comes in and out of the conversations. I've seen organizations that will say, why don't we invite Bill to our next meeting? And then Bill can tell us how to do that. And then Bill goes and does his thing, or Jeff Cobb, or Peggy Hoffman. We brought Peggy Hoffman as a thought leader because her expertise in volunteer leadership, and she's done all of this work with ASAE yes. on research. So why would we reinvent the wheel when Peggy is interested in understanding how associations can rethink how to bring new volunteers into the marketplace? So Peggy is a great example of another thought leader right into the talent council. And because they're on the council, they're part of the conversation. They're not episodic. And they have the context for every discussion that's happening. That's exactly right. That was my point is that if you bring them in and you just kind of do a one and done, you have a challenge with the ability to think much more linearly in terms of what the organization is doing. So if you don't have them as part of the budget conversations or part of the strategy conversations, they only have a snippet of information that they need in order to be effective. So not only did we put them on the board, we put them on the board with the same terms. It's a three-year term. It's fully engaged and active. Voting powers. Wow. They are just like a board member. And just as invested as someone who's from the profession, I bet. Yes. It's getting the right people in there as well. So your friend, Lindsay, she comes in with a perspective of knowing how organizations work. She's also looked at what a virtual association looks like, which is our transition that NIGP is going to. And to be able to borrow her expertise and her lens and her perspective just enriches the conversation. I cannot tell you how many times since we launched this that we do the aha moment. And the board, the individuals that are from the profession go, I never would have achieved this on my own. Because they don't have that perspective. Yes. And the thought leaders are just embraced as, you know, a member of the community. So it's a great, harmonious relationship that's been built. Well, Rick, this has been amazing. What you've taught us is that there is a different way to govern an association. There's a different way to bring in expertise. And there's also this notion that you bring these fresh ideas to your board and you might be surprised at how willingly they accept it or maybe with some work. So, Rick... I have to have you back because we didn't even talk about the other things that you're doing to thrive as an organization. So let's do a part two. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye!